hinder that recovery. And I think that we, we need to look at uh, both sides of it. From a staff or a practitioner or an organisational perspective, I suppose this is our biggest, uh, one of our biggest challenges. Because what we are being asked to do in the recovery is we're asked to think differently. That this is not just about adding on to what we, in the traditional way we think about service provision, but it is about thinking differently. Uh, and in once we think differently, you know, because I suppose thoughts do frame actions. That if we think differently, then we may have the courage to act differently and take that step um, and be different. So I suppose what what recovery is asking us to do is to think about in terms of the. the how the current service and the current narrative in, in services is very much focused on diagnostic and symptoms, even though we think in our heads that we have moved, and I like to think we have moved, but when you meet people who use the services, again, they, a lot of the times they, they still see us as thinking in, in terms of diagnosis or symptoms, or what um, Fiona Shaw calls that we are really good symptom spotters. And I think it's a very um, you know, apt, uh, description of us in her book. Uh, we are very much, in terms of care plans, are deficit, are symptom orientated, and the need to think differently from that. And I suppose that even though we think that we're engaging in equal relationships and that we're having conversations, in a lot of the times our conversations and our dialogues are prescripted. To, so our idea is that we get people to believe what we want them to believe. And I suppose that to me is a monologue, even though it's a, you know, we may think that two people are speaking. But, and it's again, it's challenging us to think about how do we undo that type of unequal relationships and the disempowering services that uh, people are talking to about. I suppose the other thing, and we're caught here, and I think this is going to be our big challenge for the future, that we're, you know, in terms of that we are very focused on being risk averse. And we are caught within, I suppose, a professional framework and a legal framework. And I think this will be our challenge in terms of looking at how can we shift from being risk averse to much more in terms of taking and giving people the honor and dignity of making bad decisions. You know, there's none of us here in this room that haven't made bad decisions um, and known the shame and humiliation of the bad decision. And we have managed to, to, to grow beyond it and that. And I think everybody has the right and to the, the dignity of making uh, poor decisions. And I suppose as well that, the, that our current services perpetuates nearly exclusion, that we are very much focused with the individual within the service rather than needing to open out our thinking in terms of focus with helping people to, to, to engage with community. And maybe thinking about that some of our services need to be very n not ran by mental health practitioners, that what we need to be doing is working to get people within, um, the, the, to engage with community, and that maybe our, the people who experience the, the service, and I think Julie will talk a little bit more about that in terms of the recovery college and peer working. Um, so I suppose what, we, what we're being asked is to then to, to move from that kind of paradigm of thinking to start to think about the person not in the service, but the person who is living a life uh, with hopes, dreams, and wishes, that, that have a right, has a right to meaningful choice, that has a right to true partnership working, uh, that has a right for us to start to think about what are their strengths and their assets rather than their deficits. Like we seem to do, it's, we, you know, it's, it's about, in a lot of cases, looking for what I can't do. Uh, and I mean, anyone that's engaged in education uh, will tell you the first lesson I ever learned was the most important thing was to, to give the students confidence in what they could do um, and to start from that perspective and you'd get uh, things, a lot better outcomes. I suppose it's about helping people to have responsibility, but with appropriate challenge and support. Uh, that we need to think about social inclusion and building connectedness. And I suppose we need to think about what, you know, in terms of education, we talk about mentoring and coaching um, rather than sometimes in terms of ther therapy, that if we start to think in, the, in, in this other way. So where are we? I suppose, so there are some of the challenges in terms of from uh, uh, an organisation and from a practitioner point of view and equally from engaging with, with people who use the services and families. So where are we in terms of to date? I suppose when you think back that in 2006, we've seven years since the first time the word recovery entered the uh, 
lexicon of Irish mental health practice with the vision for change. And it was in 2006 in that document it said that recovery should be the cornerstone of uh, our mental health practice. Since then, we had a discussion paper in 2005 from the Mental Health Commission. We, in 2007, the Mental Health Commission put recovery focused approach as one of the standards. We had the recovery framework in 2008, and then we had mental health reform just in 2013. Uh, produce their document on what, you, what people should expect from a recovery oriented mental health service. Um, and we recently, from a nursing point of view, we've had the Vision for Change document, uh, our Vision for Psychiatric Nursing and Mental Health Nurse, that again, one of the major pillars within that is on recovery. But as Walsh et al, who are my colleagues in DCU, says that although the shift from traditional psychiatry or biopsychiatry to recovery can be achieved on paper with a few deaf strokes of a pen, actualizing the shift within practice is far more challenging. And I think that, that that is very, very true. But we have managed to do certain things within Ireland. And I suppose I just wanted to give you a quick brief overview. I suppose one of the big national projects is the Advancing Recovery uh, Project, which start, started in, in the Mayo Mental Health Services, and there's about seven other services that have been involved with, with that. And I suppose that project is set up on the Sainsbury Centre for Mental Health organisational challenges, where it is looking at creating the culture of recovery, changing the nature of day-to-day -day interactions, looking at the whole personalisation and choice, looking at service user-led education, looking at a recovery education centre, look, again looking at the risk assessment, re redefining how service user uh, is are involved within the services and transforming the workforce and they're doing a lot of work on peer workers, community connectors, individual placement coordinators and support workers in, in Mayo. And there are other, as I said, seven, but that's at a very early stage in its development. Other projects we have and is the, you see, the, if you haven't heard of them, they are the mental health uh, trialogues and they are happening in different parts around the country, and some of this is being funded by uh, Genio. And the trialogue is really about creating a neutral space for service users, families, practitioners, and communities to develop a shared understanding of mental health issues with a view to transforming thinking and action on ways to deliver services. And I suppose this is, these are really exciting projects, I think, in terms of when you start to think about getting communities, service users, families, and practitioners uh, together in the one room. The other project that you will maybe hear about today is the OLIS project, which is a project that has been uh, developed in collaboration with uh, service users and families in, in Selbridge. Uh, and it, Again, it was about responding to some of the needs and expressed needs of families around the need for information, and, that, um, and that's in its early stages. Again, it's been rolled out into a, a number of um, services in the East Coast, and it's been also been evaluated, and so far some of the outcomes of it is... Um, are showing some positive things, but I think the one of the, the one things about this is that it is both clinician and peer led. So it's not about the clinicians uh, leading out in the education. So each program, if it's service user focused, it's a clinician and service user led, and family um, program, it's led by a family member and uh, a clinician as well. We also have the cooperative learning project, which is uh, happening in in DCU. And we have what you're seeing in terms of wellness recovery action planning is being rolled out in some of the services. Um, and that there, again, there's a greater, you can gradually see a commitment to engaging with service users and family members in terms of um, developing uh, recovery plans. And I suppose other initiatives then we are seeing is some peer advocacy. We have uh, a whole new program starting in terms of uh, very slowly in terms of hearing voices groups and that has been thanks to Ethna in terms of funding us to uh, have the assistance of Jackie and that to help us with that and she'll maybe talk a little bit about that. I suppose there's a, and Schliella is a housing project that is a very interesting housing project in Cork uh, that you know people should look and see the model um, 
that is going on in Cork there. We have some home focused teams that, and in terms of development of assessment tools, we have work that's happening on the recovery context inventory. And I suppose that's one of the um, assessment tools that has been developed within the Irish context. Like there's quite a lot that has been developed within um, uh, the States and within the UK, but in terms of a uh, tool that has been developed within Ireland. So I suppose the wheels of change are moving slowly, but we are moving. Uh, and I think we have quite a number of pieces happening in practice. If from a research point of view, I think we, we are not as, uh, as advanced in terms of researching and in terms of researching outcomes. We do have two, I suppose, big studies that were, was done on recovery narratives, which was Yulia cartelova Doherty's study that was done a few years ago in, uh, as part of um, the HRB. And we also have Mike Watts, which looked at recovery through peer support. And we have some uh, stuff happening within education. So if you were to say where are we in the change process, you know, I think it's hard to, for us to say. I think that, that we still have people that are debating whether this is a good idea or not. We still have people debating that they're not, we, you know, in terms of where's the evidence to support this. Um, and we have some people that are starting to transform ideas. So I think we are somewhere on... on we have some people still up at the top and we have some people down uh, that are transforming ideas. But the one thing we can, I, can, I feel myself from looking at stuff that's happening around the country, that we are getting a momentum. And so I think that that uh, change is happening. But not to be complacent, I think we have a lot of challenges. I think that one of the biggest challenges is getting good national and local leadership. At the moment, things are happening um, in pockets. And I think that what we need is some coordinated push at a national level to, to, to uh, get this. I think from a, at, a, at a clinical level, we need to start to look at, I suppose, recovery-oriented care planning and what does that mean in terms of social inclusion? What does partnership approach towards positive risk-taking mean? How do we engage with peer-led organisations and the wider community? And how do we become more externally focused? How do we look at recovery-oriented prescribing practices? How do we recognise the needs of families? And how do we move, I think, from a them and an us culture? And I suppose it's like we talk about service users and, as if, and family members as if they're separate to us. And I think that when we stop doing that, we will have made a uh, major because we know that of all of us that work in the mental health service, there's a huge percentage of us that have experienced mental health problems, either personally or within our families. But in a lot of cases, the, the culture of the mental health services is that it's not safe to be out. And I think that is, says something about us as a, as a group of practitioners as well. And I think that that may be, you know, when we see that, that it's safe to be out in the mental health services and work in the mental health services, then I think we will have made a major shift. But equally, I think the other challenge for us is then looking at research into outcomes. And I know people say, oh, well, we know it works. But I think in today's economic climate, we do need research into the outcomes. Uh, and how we define those outcomes then is a challenge to us that we don't take on traditional definitions of outcomes. But I suppose the, the other is that we need is... I suppose a fiscal, what I call a fiscal paradigm shift, that we need to start funding lives, not services. And I think the big challenge will be if we go down a road of personal budgets, uh, how that's going to shape uh, services. And I suppose I'm stealing this slide from Michael D. Higgins, The Notion, and he spoke about it, and he, and he stole it from, I'm trying to think which is the philosopher, the name is gone. And he talked about the ethics of memory when he visited South America. Uh, and the challenge of you know, staying and remembering the past. And I think that for us is really one of the biggest challenges. Because when we start to working with service users and family members, if we were to do it in a true collaborative partnership way, then what, we, what they have to say to us, often we don't want to hear. And I think the challenge for us will be to hear that and still move on. And I think the challenges for people who use the services, and whether it's service users and family members, is to help us to move on. That it's not always about the negative, but we do need to create that space to hear uh, the negative and hold it. So I suppose the big challenge then is for each one of us is that we, 
in some ways, it's about personal change, because nothing changes until you change, and everything changes once you change. So it is more than, I think, adopting a language of recovery. It's about incorporating values and principles underpinning recovery into uh, services and really challenging each other and, our, and ourselves to think in creative ways. And I think that is one of my anxieties, is that we um, just incorporate things into the existing wineskin that, in fact, we need to start to think about uh, things in a very, very different way. And I hope that this is, uh, you maybe recognise this piece, and this is the, my last thing, and it says, it, it could be a mistake and a very unfortunate one to consider that what happened to us derived from malice or stupidity on behalf of the staff. Quite the contrary, our overwhelming impression of them was of people who really cared, who are committed, and who are uncommonly intelligent. Where they failed, as they sometimes did painfully, it would be more accurate to attribute those failures to the environment in which they too found themselves than the personal callousness. Their perception and behaviour were controlled by the situation rather than being motivated by a malicious disposition. In a more benign environment, one that was less attached to global diagnosis, their behaviour and judgments might have been more benign and effective. And this is a quote from 1973 on Rosenham on the study on in being insane in insane places, if you don't uh, recognise it. And I just wonder that it's at 73, you know, is there a possibility that people could write that still today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. As usual, thought-provoking, challenging, and if we're all sitting comfortably in our seats beforehand, I think we're all perhaps a little bit uncomfortable in our seats now, because certainly Agnes has thrown down the gauntlet um, to all of us um, going forward from today. I would like to now introduce our, our next speaker, Ms Jackie Dillon, who's going to address us on listening to our voices, the work of the Hearing Voices movement. Jackie is the National Chair of the Hearing Voices Network in England. She's Honorary Research Fellow at Durham University and Birmingham City University and Honorary Lecturer in Clinical Psychology at the University of East London. She's a respected campaigner, writer, international speaker and trainer specialising in hearing voices, psychosis, disassociation, trauma, abuse, healing and recovery. Jackie has worked within mental health services for more than 15 years in a variety of settings including community, acute, low, medium and high secure settings, prisons, colleges and universities. Along with Professor, Professor Marius Rahm and Dr Sandra Escher, she is the co-editor of Living With Voices, an anthology of 50 voice hearers' stories of recovery. She is also co-editor of Demedicalising Misery, Psychiatry, Psychology and the Human Condition and Models of Madness and has published numerous articles and papers, and is on the editor editorial board of the journal Psychosis. Please welcome Jackie to address us. Thank you. Um, I forgot to put, actually, on my CV, I've also got three O-levels and a CSE Grade 2 in maths, so uh, I'm actually very clever. <laughs> So it's lovely to be here. Um, I've been coming to Ireland quite a lot in the past year or two, um, doing quite a lot of work around hearing voices. So it's great to be at this conference and be able to tell you more about this approach to working with these experiences. So I'm going to crack on. Um, so the Hearing Voices Movement, for those of you who don't know much about our work, um, last year we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Global Hearing Voices Movement. So many people talk about this being a new approach to working with hearing voices, but actually it's been around for quite some time now. Um, it was pioneered by the work of a Dutch psychiatrist, Professor Marius Rom, and his colleague and partner, Dr Sandra Escher. And What's really unusual about Marius Rom is that he was asked by one of his patients, this young woman called Patsy Hogg, to actually adopt a different approach to working with these experiences. And unusually for a psychiatrist, he actually listened to, to his patient and was really willing to think, uh, to, to think in a different way about these experiences. And I'm going to come back to this. 
So as many of you will know, the traditional approach um, within biological psychiatry is to see these experiences very much as, as a product of brain and cognitive thought. So it's very much locating the problem in people's brains. And really what this approach is asking is that we look at the problems in people's lives. So we shift away from this very biomedical way of looking at things. So really, Rom and Esch's work, have, have, they've advocated for this radical shift. And, and in 30 years that they've been doing their research, I think this is the heart of the approach, really. The A voices make sense. People's voices actually make sense um, when looking at the traumatic circumstances in life that, that provoked them. And, uh, and for me, these are the two key things, that voices make sense and this very important link with traumatic experience. I'm going to come back to that idea. Um, so Romanesh's research have found that people who hear voices, and of course, as you know, many people have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, or we're seeing a lot more in England now of people being diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, new kid on the block, bipolar disorder. So again, you know, if I had more time, you could argue actually that there are sort of cultural and political issues at stake here, why diagnoses change. Um, but what Romanesh have found is that about 77% of people who reported hearing voices, um, there was this very strong link with voice hearing and traumatic life events. It's important to note, however, that they weren't seeking trauma. They weren't saying, they, they hadn't made this connection. That just came up in interviewing hundreds of voice hearers in detail about their experiences. And in fact, there's a lot more research that's been carried out subsequently that is, is making that link even more strongly in, in, in asking much more specific questions about adverse life events. Um, one of the important things about the work of the Hearing Voices movement is it, and, and it goes back to some of the stuff that Agnes was just saying about power, really, which I think is very, very important, um, is that the, the Hearing Voices approach very much contests this traditional psychiatric relationship of the dominant expert cl clinician and the passive recipient patient. And what we are actually doing is something quite different. Our work is based on mutually respectful partnerships, um, authentic partnerships between experts by experience and experts by uh, profession working together to bring about the emancipation of voice hearers. And this is something that Marius Rom talks about a lot, emancipation. And again, coming back to this idea about people's civil rights and people's human rights. Um, and we view voice hearing as a significant and meaningful human relation, uh, experience. And again, if I had more time, I'd, I'd go into the history of hearing voices, you know, prior to the advent of biological psychiatry, that voices was understood very differently. And of course, if you go to other parts of the world um, where things like schizophrenia don't exist, if you go to sh shamanic cultures and other traditions where voice hearing is seen much more positively. Um, so... What do we do? Well, one of the things we do is we create sanctuary, safe spaces to share taboo experiences where there are real possibilities for healing and growth. It's important to note that hearing voices is both culturally taboo and also is often personally taboo. Um, I'm somebody who hears voices, and if I'm in a pub having a drink with people and they say to me, oh, what do you do? Well, you know, I work for the Hearing Voices Network. How did you get involved in that? Well, I hear voices, most people stand back and go, oh, and you can see them really trying to reconfigure that information in their heads. Um, so I think it's, it, it's, you know, it's something that's very taboo, and I think even within mental health services, it's on that further end of the continuum when you start talking about voice hearing experiences. Um, and as well as those sort of cultural taboos, for many people, the voices are talking about personal taboos. As a young man that I work with said to me, it's like my voices know my Achilles heel. They know the things that I feel most ashamed of, the things that I feel most worried about, the things that are very private to me. Um, so therefore, this need to create safe spaces where people can talk um, in, in, in a free and open way is really, really important. 
So in Hearing Voices groups, people are free to share and explore their experiences in detail, including the content of what the voices say, without threat of censorship, loss of liberty or false me medication, which for many people has been a common feature of their experiences in traditional psychiatric settings, that when people start talking about their voices, um, and particularly the content of the voices, particularly if the content is deemed to be worrying, um, then there are normally quite negative consequences consequences um, and, and I think again that's why these groups are so important because people are free to really explore their experiences without the threat of something happening to them. Um, and while auditory hallucinations is the preferred jargon within psychiatric literature, the term hearing voices, which uses ordinary, non-pathologised language, which is framed subjectively, which is much, about, much more about people's lived experiences, has been reclaimed. Um, and this is part of a wider aim within the mental health user movement to decolonise decolonize, medicalise language of human experience um, and really just try and talk in ordinary terms um, about these quite extraordinary experiences. Um, so the Hearing Voices Network in England has been established for about 25 years um, and it's a network of people like me who hear voices, their friends and relatives, carers, support workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, um, social workers, a whole broad range of professionals, and we work together to gain a better understanding of voices, visions, tactile sensations, and other sensory experiences. Um, sometimes the Hearing Voices Network is accused of being anti-psychiatry, um, which is a nice tactic to really silence any criticisms, I think, to just try and put us in the anti-psychiatry branch. Um, and in fact, I would contest that. You know, our work was pioneered by a psychiatrist who's still very involved, and I do lots of work with some excellent psychiatrists. So for me, it's not about being anti-psychiatry, but it's certainly about critiquing the biomedical model, which I and thousands of people across the world have not found very helpful in trying to deal with our difficulties. Um, and in fact, I would argue that the, net, the, the Hearing Voices movement has been so successful across the world um, because of key professional alliances that actually working with professionals has been really, really important. And in fact, the fact that I'm here today is because of some crucial professional alliances. Um, so I think these alliances are really, really important. And it comes back to this idea of mutually respectful relationships, that it's about us all working together to try and create change. Um, and the other thing to say that, of course, for many people who hear voices, they may have these other additional experiences like seeing visions and having other unusual tactile experiences, people smell and taste things and have other physical sensations and we work with all of those um, experiences. Um, we offer a range of different services um, and one of the main ways that we support people is through running hearing voices groups, setting up and establishing hearing voices groups. In England alone now there are about 180 hearing voices groups operating across the country um, and it's, a, it's an approach in the 25 years that the hearing voices network that has been established that has moved from being seen as this quite radical fringe activity to being more and more adopted by the mainstream um, and in fact the healthcare commission in 2008 which is a national um, government body that goes around and assesses mental health trusts around the country actually commended trusts that offered this as, a, as an intervention um, and so the next day we had a number of trusts that came at the bottom of that lead table on the phone to us asking if we'd come and do some work with them around developing hearing voices groups. Um, we run groups mainly in the community which is our preference you know in non clinical settings but saying that we have lots of groups running in acute psychiatric wards I know I was talking to Mary last night over dinner and there's been lots of work going on in Dublin in trying to bring this approach into acute care settings um, we do lots of work in prisons and secure settings as well um, so in London we've been funded to set up a hearing voices group in every London prison and we're doing that work. Again, it's very innovative work. We're doing this work with prisoners. We're training prisoners and prison officers alongside each other to run these groups. The other thing that we do is run hearing voices groups for children, young people and families because one of the things that our researchers found is that many of us begin hearing voices as children. I did and many people do. 
and, and I guess what we're interested in is trying to create a different pathway for, for children and young people so that they don't end up in adult mental health services. Um, and what we found is if we support children and, and young people, then they can make sense of their experiences. And we also support mums and dads and family members because what we found is if they feel less freaked out about what their child's going through, they're in a much better position then to support their child. Um, so we do lots of work. We do lots of research. Um, we're about to embark on a big study, study looking at the effectiveness of hearing voices groups. And again, if I have more time, I would talk about the politics of research, because I guess one of the questions for me is that despite the lack of evidence um, to support hearing voices groups, there are thousands of groups operating across the world. So for me, it does raise the, qu raise the question of like, who are we doing this research for exactly? Um, we do lots of work with the media. I think the media have a really important role um, often in, in, in these very negative representations of mental health. Um, so we try and get, do as many, uh, create as many media opportunities as possible to try and create um, positive stories. Um, I'm currently uh, making a, a radio programme with RTE for Documentary One, um, which will hopefully be broadcast in December um, about me, because I'm endlessly fascinating, um, and my work. <laughs> um, so, again, that's, you know, and, and what it, I guess it, it, it means is that people like me have to take a stand and say, I'm willing to talk openly about these very stigmatised and taboo experiences. Um, we're also uh, a member of Intervoice, so InterVoice um, is the international network. So I'm the chair of the Hearing Voices Network in England. So I help coordinate hearing voices activity across England. InterVoice coordinates hearing voices activity across the world. Um, so just to, to, to sort of emphasise that this started with a small group of people getting together in a room. And from that, um, we now are spreading like wildfire across the world. There are hearing voices networks in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, England, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Holland, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Kenya, Malaysia, New Zealand, Norway, Palestine, Scotland, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Uganda, USA, and Wales. Um, yeah, it's, Wales is a separate country, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so the Welsh tell me. Um, and so world domination is nigh. I have been accused of grandiosity, but um, we are well on our way. And actually, in the course of my work, I've travelled to many of these countries, so I've discovered there have been some benefits to going mad. Um, and just to say in Ireland, as I said, I've been over a few times, we've done training courses, three courses now at UCC. Um, I was in, I've been in Dublin last year, I'm running a course in, uh, uh, so I was at Trinity last year, I'm going to be um, at DCU Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week, then I'll be back in Galway in December and then Sligo. So by the end of the, this year, about 200 people will have been trained in this approach in Ireland, which I'm absolutely delighted about. Um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to Ethna, Agnes and, and Harry Geibels for making that happen. Um, and again, I think, you know, these professional alliances are really, really important. Um, so, and just to say, the training course that I deliver in, in, in skilling people up to run these groups is a mixed group. And I think, again, that, that is quite innovative and quite exciting that we usually have about 25, 30 people and there will be a mixed group of people with lived experience of hearing voices. And then we've, we've had nurses, OTs, we've had doctors, we've had a broad range of professionals attending those groups, which I think is really, really important. That we're trying to create change at a number of different levels. Um, the work has been, Maris Rom and Sandra Escher's work has been chronicled in this trilogy. Um, the first book, Accepting Voices, came out in 93, then Making Sense of Voices in 2000, and then finally Living with Voices in 2009. Um, I'm going to talk about Living with Voices um, because it's got my name on it and it's the best book, I think. Um, and, and actually it fits very well with the theme of today, which is about recovery stories. Um, so as it says, it's...